our next speaker is Kai Hong Wong, who is a postdoc in the Chin Lab at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Wong will discuss the Chin Lab's pioneering techniques in de novo genome synthesis. Um, so basically, uh, what I have been trying to do is, uh, is basically following a seemingly delusive dream. Basically, if we look back in, uh, into, into history, one thing has been said since the very beginning of life, and that is the central dogma in which the DNA makes RNA makes protein. So the genome not, not only contains all the DNA, which contains the information of life, it also contains a defined set of decoding rules dictating which one of the 64 triplet codons uh, encode which one of the 20 natural amino acids. And here are the 20 natural amino acids. They do offer diverse chemical uh, properties. But if you, but if you compare the pro chemical pro properties offered by the 20 natural amino acids compared to the unlimited chemical space in the universe, this is only a tiny spike in the un unlimited, uh, 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 basically, uh, the, the, the sea of chemical space. And the idea is, if we could potentially go beyond the limitation of the 20 natural side chains on the 20 natural amino acids, then basically where evolution can take us, or more importantly, where bioengineering driven by human determination can actually bring us to. And because of the decoding rules are embedded in the very center of the whole genome, it is, it is, very, it is basically impossible to change the decoding rules to basically go beyond the, the 20 natural amino acids without changing the genome. And basically here hence our idea to basically, if we could, the normal synthesize a brand new genome. Then in that brand new genome, we can redefine, arbitrarily redefine a new set of artificial <laughs> synthetic decoding rules, which potentially will enable us to venture beyond the limitation of the 20 natural set chains, which can bring us potentially uh, many, many unlimited potential applications to better human life. And now the fundamental challenge is how we actually uh, make a new genome and how basically how we engineer a new genome that actually go beyond the limitation of nature. If we look into the natural decoding rules uh, as in the wild type decoding, uh, decoding, uh, decoding box, essentially there are tremendous redundancies how nature uses 64 triplet codons to encode only 20 natural amino acids, for example, in the serine decoding boxes, nature used up to six serine codons to encode for the same serine and uh, serine natural amino acid. And the idea we want to do is basically, potentially, if we could reduce this, uh, this, this redundancy and free up some of the natural triplet decoding space, then potentially we could use this freed up triplet decoding space to reassign to encode for unnatural amino acids with 100% efficiencies. However, because of the density of the target codons, TCG and TCA, in order to, to be reassigned to encode unnatural amino acids, it needs to be removed from the wild type genome completely. And because of the number of TCG and TCAs, and because of the density of TCG and TCAs across the whole genome, the only realistic way of actually achieve such a reassignment to encode for unnatural amino acids is to the novel make a brand new genome. Then the question is transferred into how can we actually find a method to allow us to actually de novo synthesize a new genome. Conceptually, there are two possibilities. The, fi the first one is the one pioneered by uh, Gibson, uh, by, that, by, by Dr. Daniel Gibson and uh, other uh, research pioneers in the Craig Venters Institute, in which they de novo synthesize a brand new genome and they use that to replace the wild type genome in a, in a cell, basically through the genome transplantation uh, pathway. However, this so far has only been realized in the mycoplasma, which has one of the smallest genome in the entire life systems. The smallest mycoplasma is of the size of around 600 uh, kbs, and which is around one eighth the size of the E. coli genome. And basically, because of the compact size of the mycoplasma genome, makes it an ideal system for the genome transplant transplantation. But because of Essentially, it's tremendously difficult to handle a, a bigger piece of the genome. This, this method is tremendously limited to mycoplasma so far and, and, and tremendously difficult to transfer to other domains of life, for example, into E. coli. And also, there's another fundamental challenge with the genome transplantation because we are really in the very early days of designing new uh, genomes and we are bound to make mistakes. And it has been shown that a single mistake in the synthetic genome is, is sufficient to, to derail the entire operation, such that there's no survival clones. 
then basically we would only know that synthetic genome is not viable. There's no clue, there's no feedback to allow us to figure out exactly where the synthetic lethal is, where that design flaw is. And basically in order to uh, you know, answer all these challenges, we would like to entertain the second possibility of, of genome synthesis, which is rather than replace the entire genome at one go, we would like to basically replace a significant chunk of the genome at a time. Then basically if we could iterate this approach, then basically in a few steps, potentially we could convert the entire wild type genome into a brand new synthetic genome. And also as we basically making the wild type genome into a progressively more and more synthetic genomes, on each step we would like to have the ability to really pinpoint and identify potential design flaws and with the ability to actually fix such design flaws before we move on to replacing the next junction of the wild type genome. And potentially if we can do this, and if we can really uh, also do this with significant uh, lens on the walking along the wild type genome, then potentially in a limited number of steps, we can basically make the wild type genome into a brand new synthetic genome. Then the fundamental question is, can we actually do this? Right, basically the classical method to actually introducing a synthetic piece of DNA into the genome is by the classical lambda right recombination in bacteria. And basically you have one piece of linear double strand DNA probably made by PCR, and you transform that double strand linear a synthetic DNA which is coupled with a positive selection marker into the cell. And at the same time, you basically uh, do recombination. And you select for the right recombinant with, by selecting the coupled positive selection marker. And this has been essentially the, uh, the default, uh, default tool for uh, introducing synthetic piece of DNA into E. coli genome for decades. However, it does come with several limitations. First, the efficiency of the overall uh, recombination is really, really low. And that is fundamentally because it is a coupled event between the transformation and the recombination. Essentially, both of the two events are really, really unlikely. And for the two to happen at the same time becomes extremely unlikely, which basically fundamentally makes the efficiency, overall efficiency of the whole process very, very low. You typically have maybe around uh, two, uh, like a few hundred clones per experiment. And also making things worse, as the size of the synthetic DNA gets longer and longer, the efficiency of the transformation drops down really, really fast. And it's such that beyond, say, a 10 KB, of the synthetic DNA, it's, it's, it's impossible to get any clones at all. And also, the integration of the synthetic DNA into the genome by the classical recombination is purely a function of the homology regions, which is not 100%. You routinely have off-target integrations onto alter, on the alternative loci of the genome, leading to false positives. Right? Essentially, the typical hit rate into the right location by the classical recombination range from like a few percent to uh, maybe 80, 90 percent. And in this particular case, it's <coughs> around 50 percent. And we really need to address all these fundamental limitations before we can really have a reliable method of walk along the genome and replacing the wild type one into a synthetic one. And how do we actually answer like these limitations, right? And basically, in order to do that, we designed and developed this new uh, platform which we call Replicon Exceeding Enhanced Recombination, or REXER. And the principle is really simple, right? The fundamental reason we have the limited efficiency and the length dependency in the classical recombination is because the transformation and recombination is coupled. Then basically the key in solving the, these limitations indeed lies in decoupling the two coupled events. Right, the way we actually decouple the two is we actually, rather than transforming the synthetic DNA directly into the cell, we actually first put the linear synthetic DNA onto an artificial uh, replica, in this case a bacterial artificial chromosome. And then we transform this bacterial artificial chromosome which holds the synthetic DNA stably into the cell. And we pick a colony, grow it up. Then in that population, every single cell will contain the back which contains <coughs> the synthetic DNA. Right? Then basically we, we use CRISPR and Cas9 and excise the synthetic DNA from the back cassette, from the back carrier, exposing double strand breaks there and there in the, in the Rexel 2 cuts. And also in a similar Rexel 4 cuts, we not only uh, excise the synthetic DNA from the genome, we also basically uh, make a double strand breaks on the genome at the designed locus. And finally, basically, 
uh, we basically select for the, for, the, for the right integration by essentially select for the gain of the coupled double selection cassette together with the synthetic DNA. And also the loss of a, neg of, of, a, of, a, of, of, of a different double selection cassette, which we use to mark the designed integration side on the genome. And in this case, by selecting the, the gain of the plus two, which is coupled with the synthetic DNA, and the loss of the negative selection marker minus one, which is used to mark the genomic locus of interest, essentially by, by gain of plus two and loss of minus one at the same time, uh, this allows us to have 100% local specificity. And for the, and for the REXA2 and REXA4, because of the decoupling of the, recombi uh, of the transformation from the recombination, essentially uh, we achieve uh, tens of thousands of efficiencies with REXA2 and actually tens of millions clones per experiment with REXA4. And we have the same efficiency regardless whether we are integrating a 2KB piece or whether we are integrating a 200 piece case, uh, 200 KB piece. Then basically we first I implied, uh, try to use the, the REXA strategy to actually integrate long piece of synthetic DNA as insertions. In this, basically what we do, we first mark the genomic locus of the of the interest for the, for the, for the integration with the, with the insertion of the first double, the first double selection cassette minus one plus minus one plus one. Then we synthesize a 90 KB synthetic piece of DNA and put a, double, a second double selection cassette minus two plus two onto it. And also we put uh, uh, like five different genes from the luciferase uh, opera, which basically when all, when all present in the same cell, we'll give the cell bioluminescence. Basically, we spread the five luciferase genes across the 90 KB synthetic DNA as markers to make sure, essentially, uh, if we have a light, if we have a cell that actually lights up, it indicates has all the five uh, marker genes. Then, basically, then we cut out the synthetic piece from the uh, bike, or we cut out the synthetic piece from the bike and also excise the double selection cassette from the genome. Then, basically, then, then, for the, if we just cut out the synthetic piece from the back, the, following the REXA2 strategy, then essentially the synthetic DNA will integrate into the genome through the strand invasion pathways. But if we basically cut both the back and the genome, then basically we, 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 we actually generate four double strand breaks. Then in this case, the synthetic DNA can actually integrate into the genome through the strand annealing pathways. And the strand annealing systems is basically fundamentally a lot more efficient than the strand invasion. And then we select for the gain of plus two and the loss of minus one. And basically we have the right integration of the uh, synthetic 90 KB of DNA integrated into the right locus. And if, if basically if any one of the marker genes is missing, then the cell will not light up. And in order, to, in order for the cell to light up, you need all the five genes to be there. And basically, with the REX4, we really have uh, like tens of millions of clones per experiment. This is a 10,000 fold dilution plate for, of, the, of one uh, REX experiment. And uh, basically, if you turn off the light, then basically you see every single cell on the plate will light up, indicating it has the entire 90 KB uh, synthetic region, synthetic DNA integrated into the right locus. And if you superimpose uh, the, two, uh, the two pictures, it really indicates the, uh, the, we have 100% uh, integration uh, efficiency into the right locus. All right, and that is for, the, for insertion. Then basically we can apply the same principle for replacement. And in this case, essentially you just put uh, the 100 KB designed to replace the first 100 KB of the wild type genomic sequence with synthetic sequence. Then you do the REX experiment, select for the gain of plus two, loss of minus one. Then you have your first 100 KB genomic segment on the genome replaced with a synthetic segment. And one important design feature of the REX system is the product of the first round of REX will serve as a template for the second round of REXA right away. And basically in the second round of REXA, you basically synthesize the consecutive second, second, uh, second 100 KB uh, of uh, <coughs> synthetic sequence uh, designed to replace the consecutive second 100 KB on the, on the, on the wild type genome. And then you select for the gain of plus, uh, plus one and which is now coupled with the synthetic DNA and the loss of minus two, which is now on the genome. Right, then, then, then in this way, 
you would have the second consecutive 100 KB on the genome replaced with purely synthetic sequence. Basically, everything uh, genotypes and phenotypes correctly. And with this ability, and also with the, uh, with the ability of using the bacteria artificial chromosome, which allow us to hold at least 300 KB of synthetic DNA, of synthetic DNA, we actually envision uh, we could basically convert the entire wild type genome, which is running the size of 4.5 KB, uh, 4.5 megabase, into a brand new, the novel synthesized genome in around 15 steps. And each of the regular steps takes around a week. So basically, uh, if we have the budget to actually really pay for the synthetic genome, that, that, that potentially that genome can be made in like a few months. Right now, basically, we have the, uh, also another thing, basically, we call this strategy genome-wide stepwise, uh, genome stepwise interchange synthesis or shortened as genesis. Now, basically, uh, with, the, with, the, with the new strategy of genesis, we have the ability to actually convert the wild type genome into a synthetic genome. Then the next question is, how do we actually design the synthetic genome to actually achieve our, our goal of expanding the decoding space of the, of the natural uh, life system? Right, basically, the idea is basically if we, if we focus again, for example, on the six-fold degeneration decoding box of serine, we first identify the codons we are targeted for genome-wide removal, then we are trying to <coughs> remove them by replace them with their synonymous codons. And if we, if we could achieve that, then basically in that intermediate genome, all the TCG, TCA target codons will be completely gone, such that, such that their cognitive RNAs will not be redundant. Then we can delete these redundant TRNAs. Then basically we completely freeze up the decoding space as for the TCG and TCA. Then we can uh, basically reassign them to encode for unnatural amino acids, right? Then basically then the question is, how do we actually determine which one of the remaining synonymous codons we can use to actually replace uh, our target codons for the genome-wide removal? We cannot do this randomly because codon choices matters, and we cannot do this combinatorially throughout the whole genome because the number of the genome required to actually explore other possibilities exceed the number of items in the universe. So basically, the, uh, you know, the only way we envision to actually answer this challenge is we're trying to identify the best synonymous replacements by matching a codon specific decoding uh, properties, and also ideally trying to uh, uh, basically va validate on a defined region before we rule out onto the whole genome. And basically, we try, for example, these are the TCG and TCA target codons. We are trying to identify their, their best synonymous uh, replacement by matching codon specific translation efficiencies. In this case, measured by uh, different indices specific for codon uh, specific translational uh, properties like CAI, <coughs> codon adaptation index, TAI, and the TE, which is the third indices we actually developed in house. And by uh, applying like these different indices, we actually identify the, the best potential targets. Then basically, we also did the same for the leucine target codons and allyl target codons. Then basically, we also identified a 20 KB essential region, uh, which is uh, cell division or prime, which has the highest density of such target codons across the whole genome. And for, for, for a few other details I wouldn't go into, basically this leads us to believe this 20 KB particular opera is the most challenging uh, 20 KB opera in the, uh, 20 KB region across the whole genome to actually recode. Then basically, we synthesized different synthetic 20 KBs based on the different recording schemes. And then the, the plan is we try to use this the synthetic 20 KB following different recording schemes to use Rexer to attempt to replace the genomic 20 KB sequences. And if we are successful, then that is an indication like these particular recording schemes would be viable. And potentially, they can, be, they can be a good candidate for us to rule out onto the genome-wide recording. And we first actually tried with the uh, uh, serine recording schemes. In particular, we tried the serine recording schemes one, in which TCG and TCA are recorded into AGT. And when we tried this, we are actually initially very confused because for all the clones we actually uh, picked up from the, after the Rexer, although the beginning and the end of the 20 KB are always 100% integrated into the genome, in the middle of the 20 KB, we always see a chimera. And basically, uh, let me walk, through, uh, walk you through over here. And these red lines indicate the position of the affected codons. And if at one given position, if the recording is successful, 
we give that position number, uh, the value one, and color that position, right? If that position remains wild type despite the attempt of the Rex recording uh, strategies, we give that position value zero and color that position black. Then basically, for, for the recording scheme one, all the, all the survival clones show the camera across the 20 KB. And then what we did is we overlay all these individual recording uh, sequences into uh, something we call the compiled recording landscape, which indicates to us there's one, there, there's just one single codon position across the entire 20 KB that always remains as wild type, can never be recorded in our attempts. Then we, feel, we think this is really confusing and we don't know what's going on. Then we tried a different recording schemes, recording scheme three, which is highly related to recording scheme one, which is only different by a single nucleotide in the recording rules. However, for recording uh, scheme three, basically all the recording attempts just works all the way through. Essentially, for the majority of clones, we have like full recording from the beginning to the end. Then we were very uh, confused. Then we were kind of wondering what's going on here at all. And this is, this is, this is what we think is going on. And potentially, if, if we have a viable recording scheme, for example, in the case of recording scheme three, then the synthetic 20 KB, so the synthetic DNA built based on this particular recording scheme is also <coughs> viable. Then basically in such circumstances, we can just replace the genomic fragment with the synthetic fragment straight away, leading to basically uh, like straightforward replacement of the entire 20 KBs. However, if a particular recording scheme, like in, the, in this case, recording scheme one, that is not fully viable, then basically the 20 KB synthetic DNA we generate based on the recording scheme will contain synthetic lethals. Then basically halfway through the Rex uh, pathway, we would actually generate uh, an, an intermediate genome which actually contains a synthetic lethal on that genome, which is not viable, which will kill the cell. And now that actually we are only selecting for the survival of the colony, the only way for the cell to actually survive this synthetic lethal is to use the wild type copy of the fragment which still hangs on for a little bit to actually cross over to replace the synthetic lethals. And then basically that is, that we basically expect is the mechanism of giving us all these chimeras which we see with the recording scheme one. Uh, taking the advantage that we have tremendously high efficiency using the Rex systems, we have like millions of colonies. We can overlay all these different chimeras, which will give us the, uh, which will give us a compiled recording landscape, which will not only basically allow us to differentiate viable recording schemes from the non-viable recording schemes, but more importantly, pinpoint precisely uh, where exactly the non-viable recording schemes, this is synthetic or lethal is, which is in this particular uh, codon position, which is uh, uh, 400, uh, the 407th codon position in the FTSA genes. Then the question is, and, and basically uh, here is, here basically shows this, this, this codon position. Uh, and for the other two recording schemes, it basically works all the way through. Then the question is, can we actually fix this particular identified uh, a synthetic lethal, and the answer is yes. If we basically uh, replace this, this, this lethal AGT codon with, uh, with alternative replacement AGC, which has been proven to be working in recording scheme two and three, then basically just by changing that single nucleotide in that single codon, then basically without touching anything else on that 20KB region, we fully revive the previous completely lethal recording scheme one Now basically works all the way through. So basically now, uh, we not based on the Rex uh, systems, we not only have a method to allow us to really pinpoint such design flaws on the new genome, it also allow us to very efficiently actually fix such design flaws. And essentially, this really gave us the ability to uh, actually walk around this, uh, this, this cycle of design test, identify flaws and fix flaws very, very quickly, which not only basically allow us to uh, fix all the potential uh, design uh, challenges as we are uh, on our way of making the, the novel synthesized fully, fully synthetic genome. It also basically lead us to find out all these hidden features on the genome design which will deepen our understanding on the genome structure. Yeah, we'll, we'll be done in a minute. Right, then basically all these, and these are the, these are the basically all the remaining uh, recording schemes. Basically uh, we did everything. And for the recording scheme seven and eight, which are the alanines, they only differ again by a single nucleotide, but, but one works all the way through, 
replacing 400, almost 400 codons at one attempt, while the other one fails catastrophically. And these are the, all the different recording schemes. And essentially, this three works straight away. Well, this particular one requires one single nucleotide fix, but once you fix them, there's no gross defect at all um, when compared to the wild type uh, string. And basically, now we not only have, we truly have actually a, a way to actually uh, make a new genome. We have the way to actually design the new genome. We also, more importantly, have the, have the ability to actually debug uh, our, our potential uh, first version of the design. And what we would like to do in the near future is really put the notion into action and really make a new synthetic genome to support a synthetic life that fundamentally go beyond the limits of nature. And that is the end of the talk. And I would like to thank all the, all the, all, all the, all the basically all, all, all the colleagues, all the comrades, which we all work together. Uh, Julia single-handedly mastered the, uh, the East assembly strategy to basically assemble all this long piece of synthetic DNA in East. And Simon and I basically developed the uh, you know, uh, bioinformatics strategies for the different uh, recording schemes. And Sam and Tian Sun basically helped for doing the experiment. And all this, I have to say, has, has been uh, supported by Jason. Essentially, uh, all this idea essentially started as one elusive dream on a piece of paper. And Jason really uh, supported us to basically pursue this apparently seemingly mad idea. And thank you everybody for the talk.